the age of 45, not 50, and this slide needs updating. <coughs> and the only contraindications that we have are patients that are 100 gram, however, with 104 week waiting lists for patients, those that were probably 80 gram, who knows. And I'm not sure if you're going to reflexy those patients or whether you just go in and do you flexi them again or do you just. It's quite difficult. Well, Isn't the, it? the question we're going to ask, I think. <coughs> Is a, it is well. <coughs> yeah, you don't actually flex your yeah. patients, so it's probably a, a good, good yeah. question for you to answer. So, as far as the indications are concerned, even though previously it is 50 years, now it is reduced to 45 years. But truthfully speaking, I've been at least three patients between 40 to 45. Oh, you, really? Yeah, because. Uh, it's all individual. So, for example, if I take this patient as an example, he has one child and he desperately needs another child. But unfortunately, he has high blood and neck. And uh, even though we know that uh, <coughs> blood and neck incision can still maintain some ejaculation, but historically we feel that like blood and neck incision means no ejaculation. PRP means no ejaculation. But as long as we preserve the ejaculatory duct around the verrou, the ejaculation may happen. The problem is the bladder neck incision is such an irreversible procedure. If, if something has happened and if he ends up is dry ejaculation, he's uh, that's it. I mean, then um, whatever the artificial insemination, everything is down to a quick and happy tour. And uh, so he came to me. He's not even from Birmingham. So I don't want to tell too many things when you can find him. Who is he? So he started as a doctor relatively, and then uh, we had a very honest talk. Even. Before doing the flexi, I know he's got only blood and neck, high blood and neck. 42 year old, it's quite rare for somebody to have a big weight and lobes. So I told him that if given the choice to me, the best outcome is just a simple bilobar prostate. The next best is the trilobar prostate with the median lobe being nicely flexible and pinnable. And the third best outcome is the median lobe, which is not very easy to handle, but you can somehow create a good channel. The most difficult outcome comes from the blood and neck because uh, it's very difficult <coughs> to master the 4D technique and uh, once you master it also sometimes uh, after doing it you may feel that the, the appearance is not as good as usually we wish. It's not something like you can throw the arrow and it will exactly hit the same place. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. It really needs a lot of numbers. I would say for 4D technique blood and neck somebody should have done at least 25 4D techniques to <coughs> say I'm more confident in that. So in that aspect, doing a flexible cystoscopy before the procedure is not a bad thing. But I don't do. The reason why I don't do is uh, two aspects. Uh, I'm very, very uh, passionate on the economics behind the Eurolift whole business case. And uh, I spend a lot of time with maybe Laura may be more interested in that from the business point of view. And uh, I do a lot of small experiments to see whether we can get the same outcome by using maybe one implant less. I try to err on the side of one implant less rather than, oh, it's a bit bulging there, can I put one more implant and do the best? I, I, I'm like that. Are you used to or more? No, my average is 2.7, average. Yes. Over hundreds of patients, average is 2.7. And um, it's not always a successful. Some, sometimes you may have a patient saying, my urine is brilliant, I'm much better than before you were left, but I feel it could be better more. Then when I go through the notes, I make a very meticulous documentation that uh, I did two implants on the left, two implants on the right. At one point, I feel there is one more implant needed, but I purposefully save from the cost point of view. So now I'm learning myself. It's like a feeding your artificial intelligence, and then you will get wiser as you go. I work out a system like that, if I'm spelling it correctly. So doing flexi is not a bad thing, but I want to make this whole Eurolift uh, pathway into the best economic model, even beating the TURP or OLAP by a good margin. That's what my try is. So my pathway is patient will be seen in the clinic, DRE done, IPSS and um, the QOL done, flow rate done, post <coughs> All the options discussed in detail, and the patient is happy for Eurolift, listed directly for local anesthesia Eurolift. There is nothing in between. So, I don't do flexi. The other reason why I don't do flexi is I'm fortunate uh, to learn the advanced techniques like 4D and you know, quite early. 
nowadays I think they say you need to do at least 20 cases before you go for an advanced course but somehow at the time before COVID the logistics was like that I had an exposure to learning the high blood and mechanism from quite early so I find by doing a flexi number one I need to do the flexi if I have to get yourself no problem with the brain Pardon? No, 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 that's what. No, what I mean is, if you, get, yeah, if you have to get a correct information, I need to do it. If somebody is doing it and documenting it, like pylobar prostate, amenable to urolith, I find their amenable is different to my yes, amenable. Yes, yes. So, if at all you are doing, we need to do by ourselves. So, that's why I scrapped that step. So, patients are coming directly to local anesthesia. And very rarely, the only main problem I come across is a median low which is not amenable or favorable for urine. That's the only reason. High blood and neck, you can do. Any DRE, prostate less than 100cc, any later low, you can do. That's not a problem. But sometimes the median low is not pinnable or requires like two implants to pin. But for that also, now we have devised some small techniques where they can use a uh, uh, fired implant uh, Eurolift one to compress the <coughs> large median lobe so that you can allow that edema and vascularity to settle down so that the unpinnable median lobe also becomes pinnable. It was uh, initially introduced by Peter Chan from Australia and now we have started using it. So slowly the real need for flexi is now really out of the window. But uh, I understand maybe the initial learning curve for first 50 patients, 60 patients, there's nothing wrong in doing a flexi. It adds your, to your confidence. Mm -hmm. And if you know you have four patients on a day, one with median lobe, you may wish to do the median lobe first to, so that you are doing the most difficult one first. Everybody has their own way of doing. So for example, if I do, nowadays I don't do any euro lift separately. All my Eurolift cases are changed into a proctorship uh, list actually. So whenever somebody visiting me, for example, last Friday we had three consultants visiting. <coughs> So I list them so that the, we have a simple case to start with so that they get their confidence and then I'll take them to the most complex case and end them with another simple case so that the confidence still stays high. So I meticulously care about very, very small things and, uh, and uh, I, I feel more inclined to that. So just to clear that again, prostate volume of motor on NCC, I've done up to 105 cc, 102 cc sometimes with almost the same outcome. But the NICE guidelines revised last year said 80cc. So we need to know at least by the books 80cc. Yeah. I just do DRE. Yeah, it's not very brilliant. Um, the way I trained my finger is uh, I have done ask you all to do lots of transperineal and transrectal biopsies. So whenever I have a patient for transrectal or transperineal biopsy, I do a DRE and have a guesstimate that this is 65 cc and then look into the MRI report if it is 70 cc again I just train my mind okay this is 70 cc not 65 a bit <laughs> so it's like that so but it took 1000 patients 2000 patients of transrectal biopsy. Well, it's smart so we I mean we work as a team you know so we all might do them for other juniors you know and uh, the patient comes to ED and this job, this is for you or whatever. We want to do the DRE as the most junior question. Maybe I'm really great with year one or year two, you know. So it's, mm -hmm. we need just to get a consensus yeah. of the more because it would be nice if it's done by someone senior. Yeah. <coughs> uh, if, if you measure the, the error, maybe like plus or minus 10, 15 cc, it doesn't matter. So you, you won't measure. You do trust, trust for that's what in the in the early stage if you want to do a trust volume if you want to do a flexi it's always acceptable but uh, i don't do because of the same reason say for example if i think this is a 80 cc prostate maximum i think i will err from 60 to 100 cc i don't think i will err more than that and 60 to 100 cc is coming to your lift anyway so it's not really affecting my day-to-day -day practice if the prostate is too large uh, nearing the 100 cc i will be very careful and the other thing is which is very favorable to me is I do all cases under local anesthesia, whether it's a median low, 4D technique, complex urolift, simple urolift, everything under local anesthesia. So when you're doing under local, patient is awake, when you do the cystoscope, 
Unfortunately, if the patient is definitely not suitable for urolift, lift, you may think he needs five implant on the left, five implant on the right, two for the median row, this is not good for urolift, lift, not even for TERT, maybe only for colon, then the patient is awake. So you can take the cystoscope out and explain to him and then wake him up, not even wake him up, but ask him to get down and walk out. So you won't lose much. So whatever <coughs> my other doctor mentors, because we had a DPN summit in London, and we had almost one hour <coughs> debate on this single topic that how we can avoid the pre urolip flexible cystoscopy and trasmyopsis and make the pathway quicker and also more economical for the hospital. End of the day, a lot of small procedures were not appropriately paid and also it will stretch your pathway into uh, months and months. And uh, so you are doing a flexi under local anesthesia and then explaining the patient. I am doing a rigid scope under the local anesthesia, explaining the patient. If the patient is not fit, the patient is happy to walk away. And uh, I, I do maybe six or seven patients in half a day, you can do. Instead of doing seven patients, is one of them, we are not doing neural lift and doing only rigid cystoscope. It's not going to affect your balance much. Yeah. And if you are able to do the same thing in the day unit, you are not losing anything. The same day unit, you are going to have a flexi stroke, isn't it? So I have got kind of a very strong points to support that you can tailor the pathway, maybe once you are very confident crossing the 50 patients, something like that. But frankly speaking, I got challenged by a lot of people that you are so bold in say this on a meeting when we are all not I mean, not think about doing the Eurolift without a prior flexible cystoscopy. So I leave it to your choice, but it's, it's doable. And, uh, yeah. I think some people just like to know, <coughs> they like to plan for, yeah. I know this patient's going to be a middle lobe, I know this patient's going to be need stacking, so they want to plan for it, but I guess with yourself, whatever they come with, they're going to have the treatment anyway, unless it was so <coughs> strict for them and you wouldn't, but then you'd be changing it on the day. I think we've really learned from our experience that when we're in the theatre, the consultant will say, well it says 60 but I didn't do the, didn't do the that could yeah, be anything, exactly. so really the, the yeah. benefit's not there if you're not doing any imaging anyway. When you first start doing these procedures, uh, how long do you do it with the general anaesthetic before you went to flexi? I don't know. How long were flexing and doing the uh, volume before you went to without the trust volume and the flexi? Oh, so I started doing under there. local from my starting itself. Yeah, yeah. first yeah. The very first patient in 2017, it's a list of five patients. The very first patient I did under GA because my theater team don't know what's happening. So just for their confidence, I did it under GA. That is the first and last till now. Okay. And how long were you doing the flexes for before you stopped doing the procedure? Before you stopped doing the flexes. Before you stopped doing the I haven't done flexi and trust volume from my first patient onwards. Okay. Uh, so <coughs> meticulous DRE. All I'm looking for is, is it definitely less than 100 cc? That's the only thing I'm looking for, which I'm sure to a certain extent we can be very comfortable. And then if I think it's definitely 100 cc, then the patient may have had MRA for some other reasons, or somebody may have done just for some other reasons. Race PSA. Yeah, race PSA, yeah. something like that. So you know that you are doing some patients 105 cc, but there are so many times uh, MRI measurement of 80 cc prostate is more difficult than an MRI through 100 cc prostate. Your difficulty won't definitely increase very logarithmically with your size. So it's all anatomical rather than just uh, experience alone, just the measurement alone. The measurement is more helpful, but you don't have to depend on it completely. If we cross ultrasound, there is a difference between cross and abdominal ultrasound. See, if you really want to do a, a proper ultrasound of the inner pathway, I think it's better to have a proper ultrasound. It gives a better volume and also it can give you a better measurement of the medium of uh, enlargement. So that, that because usually the is if the median lobe is protruding more than a centimeter, it's very difficult. In the invasive technologies, that's TURP, that's OLEP, and so we've got a really small slice of what actually what, what's actually happening out there with patients. It says here that 24 patients, 24 percent of patients are on watchful waiting, and 75 percent are on medical therapy. I think that calculates that patients get medical therapy and go home. But how many of those patients? probably drift towards watchful waiting because they go home with the medication, they're unhappy with it, they get dizzy, they get side effects and then they stop taking the medication. So how accurate that information is, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that we'll just present through dinner so that we don't keep you here.
Yeah, yeah, carry on. Please eat. Please carry on. Please eat. Um, I would say that the watchful waiting is probably a lot higher um, than patients that are on medical therapy. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the guidelines and what they mean. So this is the American guidelines and it just states that you should be, patients should all be made aware that if they do have a, a procedure like a TYP, that they are going, it is going to cause them to have some sort of EJD or worsen ED or EJD. Pull is, uh, is the Urolift, uh, prostatic urethral lift and it likely does not pose additional risk. So that's the American guidelines. And then here is the EAU, so the European Guidelines. And you stated earlier about this, I think NICE is 80 and uh, European is 70. And the reason that they've put it at 70 is because that's the data that we gave. Chronic attention patients. The best group is the acute attention patients, where the outcome is really good. We have Pulsar study, which is uh, presented in BAUS, EAU, EAU. And I've added just one slide in the end because I think mm -hmm. you guys have a lot of uh, retention patients waiting. Laura just told me yes. before the meeting, so we just add a couple of slides to see <laughs> the role for retention. Would it help if you put them on ISC maybe for a few months before the... Nothing wrong in it. So when the patient on a catheter and uh, I'm doing the uro lift, you should put the catheter back because the, there will be a lot of edema, so the patient may fail straight away. So it's nice to put a catheter back, do the talk in third or fifth day, depending upon your nursing arrangement and learn ISC at the same time, just do once or twice a day for a month and then make it once a day. They can encourage the patient to pass the ISC catheter after they are so they know how much they are emptying. If they are emptying well, after ISC, is nothing is coming out, then possibly they can slowly discontinue it. And you said with the, so what's the real problem with the chronic attention, floppy bladder, low pressure, weak bladder? Yes, so, but they, they're bad anyway. Yeah, even if you do TRP, they may end up having a large bit of TRP. That's 50 50, if you're lucky. Yeah. So, are you, are you find the same for your lift? You can get sort of half of them will be. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, in chronic attention and high pressure chronic attention, the, there is another player reason for the problem, which is the bladder. And just by addressing the prostate, you won't get a, the complete outcome. So, uh, the, if the patient is happy for intermittent self catheterization, there is a role for you. In there, we've got a study called the Pulsar study. It's um, a UK study. I think it was Leeds, Norwich, Brimley Park, um, six centres, and um, at um, three days, they took patients at three days, and 58% came up after three. At um, six months, it was 81%. So they're, they're good numbers. And then retention patients aren't patients that we considered four or five years ago. It's, it's because we wanted the perfect patient, but what you get through the door is the patient's inattention. So we had to study that. We had to look at that cohort of patients. And again, with the with patients that have got a middle load, um, we, I think, have put that fear out there. Don't do patients with middle loads. Let's just do patients that have got lateral loads. But that's not what you always see. So there's a medical study for as well for patients with middle loads. And they're happier than patients with lateral loads. I don't know if it's because there's more of an obstruction or like they, they just seem a lot happier. But going back to the pulsar, we've added a slide on the end to talk about retention as well. Pulsar mainly recruited acute retention and patients with post wide risk than 300 ml. So, and obviously, with you, and if it's 99% of the time, you don't put a catheter back in anyway. So, these patients won't be coming back to see your top nurses or coming back or going to see a community. I've got a hospital level up, they don't come back <coughs> for a, a different procedure, but it's because they go out to the community nurses. But it's still a cost. Someone still pays for that patient to come back and have the, you know, the, the catheter removed. So obviously this is an American slide, but within your practice these patients will come in and these patients then could get stuck in what I would like to call GP land. They're going to go and they're going to have medical therapy mm. and they're not going to probably get to the hospital for a long time <coughs> or they're going to drift into watchful waiting. Um, I think we touched on this earlier. It'd be If we can retain the data, that would be fantastic. Even if that just starts from tomorrow, I'm not sure if you're keeping the <coughs> purposes at the moment of what you've done so we, far. We keep them actually in for the system, yeah. Brilliant. Skip, That's um, fantastic. Well, we can look at the first... Like 30 or 50 patients, and that's what we like to do. Um, get hold of your own data, and then and it's good for you. It's good for yourself, Laura, to see that the patients have done well, but you haven't been keeping it. It's your proof. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> you can just use the, the patient tracker given by the Eurolift itself. So yeah. I just use them and even if I do the three monthly telephone follow up, even though it's not a correct method of connecting the IPSS and QAM, I try to spend some time to ask individual questions on the market. <coughs> Definitely there is a subjective bias, that I accept it, but something is better than not even quantifying the symptoms. Yeah, and in the patient tracker, uh, it's just a simple spreadsheet that we put together. They actually monitor how many uh, implants that you're using per patient. And a couple of years ago, NICE Guidance asked us, or NICE asked us, how many implants we're using per patient. So we just went to all the surgeons and said, have you filled this in? They were like, yeah. Yeah, well, give it to us. So we gave it to NICE, and from that they actually gave us what, the amount of implants that we use now as <coughs> a national average is 3.6. I know yours is lower. Yours is 2.7. Yeah, but as a national average, it's 3.6, and we're cost-effective at four Which implants. Is standard for four, isn't it? Yeah, but the average is four. Yeah, the average is four. But some people will have six. Some people will have two, <coughs> nine. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> We need to get it down. Yeah. Yeah. Two, 2.7, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Two implants per patient tomorrow. For <laughs> How this can be done is, uh, if I'm correct with the financial part of it, as long as your implants are four, you are as financially good as the previous TURP, because TURP entails again, especially bipolar means disposable loops or knife, mm. and then uh, saline irrigation, staying <coughs> overnight, rarely going back to theater, one night, two night, etc., etc. Mm. So if you are four implants for all the patients, you will be still marginally profitable or as equal to you. <coughs> if you are less than four, you are certainly profitable from the yeah. unit because patients are walking in, especially at the local, they are walking out, you are saving your anesthetic time, anesthetist and medications, and patients will occupy only two hours in a way. Whenever I do a six patient slot, by the time I finish the sixth patient, when I go back to say hi to them, the first and second may have gone home already. Yeah. And uh, so, and if you can reduce, as he said, if you feel like the left lobe is bigger, right lobe is relatively smaller, you start with the right lobe, you do two implants on the left lobe, you think three implants, but after two you feel okay. If you save one implant, that's good, because end of the day you have paid X amount of money for the patient, you have spent four implants, patient is fine, and if the same patient comes after 10 years or seven years and says, it was fine for the first three, four years, but I feel something is a bit slowing down, and then in those situations, I will certainly do a flexi again. It's not fair taking them again for a yearly or anything without flexi. So I certainly do a flexi. And if there is a small bulge, there is a possibility if you do two implants, the bulge can happen in between the two implants after prostate is again below <coughs> the implants. Mm -hmm. And then if you're doing an implant again, maximum you may need only two implants at the time, and you are paid again 2x for the same patient. So end of the day, for one patient walking in, you are paid 2x and you are spending maybe like six implants. But if you are doing all your six implants in the first one go, year. you are paid only one x, and still patient may end up having the same symptoms because it's a very dynamic prostate. It's prostate is not something you treat now; it's going to stay there till he dies. It's a dynamic yeah. one, so uh, you should not make the implants so low to the level patient have some respiratory symptoms immediately after the urolift lift and the surgery is failed. Mm -hmm. And you should make the patient as much comfortable as possible at the same time not just throwing in the implants also. That's how I am a bit mindful on that. So, <coughs> And you will get very good business case. Once you reach say 100, 120 patients, your implant per patient will be very good and uh, that business case will be the best example and the people will say, how can we fail in that? Mm. We did some, um, it was the biggest question that I was asked probably about four years ago was the cost of the implants because you know, people were saying, how is this compar comparable to TURP? Um, so we did some Plix data. I did it with a surgeon, uh, a surgeon and finance manager at Northampton Hospital, and that was published. And when you compare right down to a pair of gloves, a Eurolift against a TURP, the Eurolift is only um, profitable by 40, you're not allowed to say profitable, um, cost effective by £45. So they're around the same price. That's, you're not, you're not going to, you, the Eurolift against the tariff, sorry, is £45, whereas the TURP, you lose £800 per patient. The only thing that's in fact going to have is, we have to 
can borrow the scope every time they need a unit. We can look at putting some scopes on the shelf for you. Shelf oh, you have? Oh, you've got long term scopes on the shelf. <laughs> 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 You are there, you are there. It's a cost. It yeah. is. I mean, right. uh, the company as a principle is not charging it for the scope. It's, it's, uh, as long as you list a patient, say five or six patients a day, whether the scopes are already kept in the For example, in my hospital, we are keeping three scopes in the shelf always, isn't it? Eight. Eight scopes. Isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> because the volume is so high. They're just there, aren't they? Just <laughs> Make it flexible. Say, for example, if Laura is giving you five scopes to be kept in the shelf at any time, then it will be useful. If suddenly you have a patient coming tomorrow for Eurolift yeah. or something like that, or the patient comes for ERP, on the day of the morning he is discussing Eurolift and you just have to get one uh, ready made scope available for that. And uh, what I usually tell Rose is she was our regional in charge person before, before going to CME. I have eight scopes in my shelf. I think we have paid for three or four. You bought two. Bought two. Rest of them. And then the rest alone. Just make it, uh, instead of keeping it in somewhere, just use it as a storage space so that I can use it also at any time. And the Midlands is yeah. in the Midlands, so it's easy for them to take it away also. So uh, don't worry about the scopes point of view. They will give at least two scopes extra. So if it is six cases, means at least you will have eight scopes in hand because. They make good profit with the implants. As long as the implants business going on, scopes automatically will follow that. And we don't make the scopes. We get we buy them from Stortz or Show Lake. So we have to outsource the scopes. I just mentioned that to me. It's 20 French scopes. 20 French, yeah. Why is not continuous flow? It is continuous flow, but uh, well, we have to split it on and off, you know. Oh, well, why can't we make it by the way? It increases yeah. the size. I mean, if yeah. somebody is doing a G. I don't know, it's uh, something is like 40. Yeah. If you want an iglesias continuous flow. Yeah, yeah, okay. Iglesias continuous flow means mm. that there should be a layer between the two layers of the right, sister yeah. scope uh -huh. that makes the scope bit okay. bigger. <coughs> That works against the people doing under the It's not so real, no. It's just going to lead it to the other way. No. It's easier. Easier. Even instead of me going in and out several times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's something that we're looking at at the moment. Yeah, so the, the, the view, if you put like four, when you put the four, the view is a bit more like uh, uh, this. Because it'll be a bit of blood you know, here and there, so you have to wash in, come out. In. I don't know, that's one I did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's so gentle, we don't get any blood. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, regarding that, there are a lot of, uh, lot of small things like, for example, uh, going in a bit smooth and sleek and then turning the angles only in the bladder, not turning in the prostate. So like that, there are at least 10 to 12 take-home points which we can discuss maybe with a live patient. And uh, automatically, whenever uh, you are finishing one implant and loading other one, the bladder is getting empty. Mm. So, I never thought that continuous flow will increase the comfort of the surgeon. Rather, it will definitely increase the diameter of the scope, and so doing it under GA becomes a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. And now the 20 French is, is doable under local because it's a rigid scope under local. <coughs> the UK trainees are not much exposed compared to European or American yeah. or Asian trainees. If you see European, American, or Asian <coughs> trainees they, in the training training period, they are, may have done hundreds, if not thousands, oh. of gauge stent removal, local anesthesia with rigid cystoscopes. Right. That's what the training is. That's why the local... And that's why the acceptance of the Eurolift under local has become just like a norm in US, while here we are pushing the local anesthesia. That doing under GA is considered as a bit of a very unusual practice and uh, because they want to do it in their office, no anesthetist will be there, not even a voice operator. So. Um, so this is what we can provide as evidence, and this is against our lift study, which was our pivotal study. It was a study that was Eurolift against a sham, like a rigid cystoscopy. There's um, a printed copies of it on the table over there. Oh, brilliant. <coughs> They're lift study. Lift study. Thank you. So I've done this for a lot, quite a lot of hospitals, and this is, your, this is yours that we did together. So as you can see, the blue line is Amanda, and his patients started at... A lot worse than the patients in the lift study and remember the patients in the lift study the surgeons that 
new solicitor day. They were the, this was their first ever experience of, of Eurolift. So we've come a long way in you know in the last sort of six, seven years. And the patients have done better. We've only got to three months, and yeah. you can imagine what happened to three months two years ago. We couldn't collect any more data when the patients weren't coming back, but I think you said you got up to six months. Yes, a few things for uh, this is um, just only three months, and if you see there is a direct straight line because we don't uh, call the patient or see the patient in between. So after the euro lift directly, they will have telephone appointment in three months. That's why for every patient, I have only two cohort of IPS score. And uh, that's a more economical thing from the NHS point of view. And, uh, but this is only 39 patients. Now we have crossed 100. So this is a pre-COVID data. So I, I actually, I don't know that Ross is using my data. If, if I know, I may have given a more updated <laughs> one so that we can get a yeah. better chart. I, I don't know whether the chart will look the same now. Um, I, it may be. But it definitely won't be worse than lift, I'm sure, because we see the patients every day and all. Yeah, I think I've done about six of these, and everybody's is better than Lyft, and Lyft is wow. considered good, yeah. and standard, and acceptable. So uh, it's nice. It's nice for you to look back at, at retrospectively. <coughs> is the most studied BPH product currently on the market. So we've got over 25 publications. Um, I'm really proud of the data. They did it and they did it right. They started with perfect patients <laughs> on the lift. And then we have <coughs> everything else. Everything that people consider is a patient that they're going to get through the door. Pulsar, MedLift, we've studied those as well. So this is just some of the studies. Um, the BPH 6 one is a UK study. They're not all... American, and then we've got real world data as well, which is thousands of patients. So, this is the setup, this is what you're going to see tomorrow. Um, setup's no different if it's in local anesthesia or GA, so it's going to be exactly the same, apart from some people don't have the anesthetists. So <coughs> benefit of the anesthetists, that's great. Um, um, is that you? No. That's no. Good. I don't know why I ordered. <laughs> um, so you can choose either lamb or chicken tikka and then the veggie and the green fruit. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Excellent. I'll have veggie. Um, we went for the scope earlier. It's a 20 <coughs> French, zero degree, 2.9 millimeter scope. And as I said, they're made by Sholey or Storks. And this is the implant. So I'm going to pass it round. So I'll pass it to you first. So it's made of, the urethral end piece is made of stainless steel, but it's a monofilament suture. And then they've got nope. a capsule tab. So if the patient's got a nitinol or nickel allergy, then they won't be able to have a urolift. I've only ever had one with a nickel allergy. And he said it during this consultation. Then he went, oh, I don't know if that's true. My mum said it. And we were like, <laughs> go for a test. <coughs> did you have a nickel allergy? He did. Oh. Is that really <laughs> it's got to be rare. Yeah, so yeah. 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 I never, I never asked for it. I don't know. Yeah. Two pieces come together, the capsular tab and the suture will come as one piece that's inside and housed inside the device itself. And then the urethral end piece is put on. Once the suture is cut, it's spoken to the length that we need for that one lobe or the middle lobe. So then we put the urethral end piece on. They are MRI compliant, yeah, up to t uh, Tesla 3. Um, there is an artifact around the metal, um, and you can, you can still buy tea in that area, it's not a problem. Yeah, regarding, regarding that, if you have a better Tesla, like for example, compared to 1.5 and 3 Tesla, 5 Tesla will give you better image. Yeah. And uh, at any point, any implant will never get MRA approval. <coughs> it's impossible. Yeah. So MRA conditional is the maximum approval you can get. Yeah. And uh, if th there is a protocol on it from Australia on how to protocolize the MRA, the patient who had previous Euro dip, so that uh, we will try to take less cuts at the region of the Eurolip implant yeah. so that the artifacts are nicely <coughs> reduced. The maximum artifact can be reduced to one millimeter. And uh, obviously the 
radiologists can't measure the pi rad score for that one millimeter oh. area, but that should not affect any way. And uh, the area is biopsyable, especially if the urolift is done at least more than 12 months before. It is nicely cemented and uh, it's very difficult for somebody to dismantle the urolift, reducing the effectiveness. Yeah. How about the, the first test? Was the comparative even with the whole. All the patients were acute urinary retention with uh, PVR less than 300 ml. And so this is the IPS score, quality of life, QMAX, PVR, improvement, or BPH2 score improvement with pulsar study and lip study. If you see the P value, they are as compared to the lip study where none of the retention patients were used. So it has good role in the retention patient, especially in acute retention, as long as the bladder is not having a component to play in the retention. That's the main thing. And uh, the only thing is you need to put a catheter and then leave it leave with the talk for third or fourth day. Next one. <laughs> so this okay. is the one my data we presented in BOWS 2021 and almost similar to the pulsar, but it's full poster and the, the values were clear. not very legible to read. But the whole outcome is it is possible to do for acute urinary retention. You need to be very selective in chronic retention. Maybe if you want to be 100% sure of the outcome, better is to do the urodynamics so that we are happy that the bladder is nicely functioning. Then we can go for the.